Well, all of a sudden, that little youngster, she was shy. She said, I wouldn't know what to say. The pastor in a very me, he just says, just say what you, you hear your mommy say. So with that, the little girl puts her hands together. She bows her head and she begins to pray. And she says, Lord, why on earth did I invite all these people to dinner? <laughs> Prayer. We need to be aware, right, of who's listening to us. <laughs> and, and it's so funny because it's just an honest truth. I can imagine. I've said things. And I even had those type of situations, that exact thing happened to me. I asked my grandson to pray, and you know, what I realized is I was only teaching the prayer for the food. And here we were praying as a whole, not even for food. There was no food in, in for miles, you know, and when I, let, I asked him to pray, he prayed, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. And I'm going, oh my goodness. <laughs> but you know, at least that wasn't too bad a scene. I didn't want to invite all these dinner guests here. The essential key to communing, like when we come together at Holy Communion, which we'll be doing in two weeks from now, and communicating with God is we need to cultivate a devotional daily prayer. And almost every second. Have you ever, um, in fact, this kind of happened today as I was traveling. It's, it's about 35 miles zone, right? And then you have this car going about 70. And you think about it, and all of a sudden, the guy from the side street comes out. And instantly, they never really warranted God for anything. But at that very moment, because oncoming traffic, there was nowhere to go, all of a sudden, they're saying prayers. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Please don't let me get into an accident. We, we need to be communi communing and communicating with God daily, not just at those for moments. One thing about that situation that comes to mind is that I was pretty needy, and it wasn't even warranted. We never really, what kind of God is it that we're serving that that's the only moment that we need him? We need to be in devotional prayer. Devotional mm -hmm. prayer means to communicate, make the time. Which means that in order to learn or to hear God's voice, you must get to know him personally. You know, how many of you have a love of your life? Or had one, you know, or know what that means, right? Now, before you met that love of your life, there was a moment that you never cared anything about. But when that became, that person became something to that little heart inside that said, mm -hmm, I'm interested. <laughs> All of a sudden, we did a lot of things to start to learn about that person. We need to know him personally. I want to begin with a true but incredible story. Back in September 1996, a man named Eduardo, you know, I have a tendency when I see the writing or spelling of names, I like to try to emphasize how you say it. It's a true story, though, but it's, it's a, about this person, Eduardo Sierra. He's a citizen of Spain. He was on a business trip to Sweden. He was driving through Swedish countryside when he came upon a Catholic church. So he decided to stop for a few minutes, moments, go in and say a prayer. When he got into the church, there was no one there except for a coffin in the front of the church. And lo and behold, there was a body in there. So he thought to himself before he prayed, he went up and he said, oh, I'll pray over this body. He prayed over the body and off to the side was like, you know, a podium like that, and he went and he signed his name in the book. It was a book. So he signed his name in the book, and then he went back into the pews, said his prayer that he intended to do, and then he left and went about his business. Some, very, some weeks later, Eduardo received a telephone call telling him he was a millionaire. Because, you see, the body in the coffin 
was that of a Swedish businessman. With no close relatives, he had left his entire fortune. He bequeathed and made this statement. He said, to whoever prays for my soul first. Amazing. This morning, we are going to talk about the keys to effective prayer. But I wish that I could promise you that if you pray using these keys, you will receive the kind of return on your prayer that a mortal receives. Yeah. Nah, wouldn't be, wouldn't that be awesome? But we know that that's not always the case. Yeah. So one day Jesus was praying. It says in our gospel reading today, and it says he was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. The disciples were very much aware of what an important role prayer placed in Jesus' life. You know, there's choke just in the Gospel book of Luke itself, all prior to chapter 11, of how many times Jesus prayed. He prayed at his baptism. You can find that in Luke 3. He prayed during his temptation in the wilderness, Luke 5. On one occasion, he prayed all night long, Luke 6. Then in Luke 9, on the day when he asked the disciples, he said, Who do the people say that I am? He had been praying alone at home. And then again, later on, as he went to the mountaintop, he prayed again. And now Luke tells us in chapter 11, he was praying in a certain place. If prayer was so important to Jesus, then shouldn't it be important to us? Yes. I came across this quote, and I, I like to hang today's message kind of on that. Martin Luther King Jr., he once said this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, title of my message today? A breath of fresh prayer. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. As we move through the phases of the Lord's Prayer, we find ourselves today face to face with one of the greatest human needs, a breath of fresh prayer. How do you pray and why? We are not the first to ask that question. As we see today in the Gospel reading, the disciples ask. Notice something here. When did, when did the disciples ask this question of Jesus? Was it when uh, Jesus made a, hosted a special seminar? No. Was it when Jesus gave the greatest sermon in the synagogue? No. Was he giving a lecture? No. It was after. Well, sorry. Was it after Jesus preached, I'm repeating myself, a sermon? And we already answered, no. None of these circumstances. Remember this, how it's recorded in Luke 11. Jesus was praying, again I say, in a certain place. And when he finished, they said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. I want you to close your eyes and lift up your hands and say to the Lord in your own quietness, Lord, teach us to pray. Ready? Say. All together again. Lord, teach us to pray. They saw, see what the, okay, you can open your eyes. What the disciples saw in all these prayers that they noticed that Jesus went off, they heard some of them. They saw the power of prayer through Jesus. And they realized how important then if the power of prayer through Jesus would have to be for them. Here before their very eyes, they saw a personality in whom prayer was vital. Mm -hmm. It was integral. 
When I say a fresh, a breath of fresh prayer, it is like air. You guys ready to do without your air? No? And you know, I work in an elderly home. I don't have enough oxygen bottles to bring in here to give you some. But as desperate as we need that air, we definitely need to see prayer and make it fresh, renewing. Not always the same old things in our lives. Complaining, no, lifting prayer to the Lord. They needed a breath, I mean, they were giving a breath of fresh prayer. They wanted him to tell them how to pray. And so the disciples, although they were sometimes slow as we learn, as we read through the Bible, they were slow to comprehend, so are we. But at this point, they were right on target. Jesus, teach us to pray. And so they asked and they learned just as we can today. So then I have three things that I kind of plucked out of there. One, we need to pray regularly. Can you say regularly? Regularly, all the time. And so we can. He took the time. Jesus took the time to pray. He made it a vital, integral, integral part of his life. A daily schedule he always did and more. He disciplined himself to pray regularly. Let me tell you, I know that we all have busy schedules. And I know that we have deadlines. And I know that we, we're pressed for time. Because I live in this world too. And still, yet I know that nothing works out until we go seek that relationship with the Father in prayer. Belief in word, continue to build on that relationship with God. And so, there's, a, I, there's another story. There's an English missionary. Her name is Florence Alsholm, who once said, there is really only one test of prayer life. She said, do we want God? Do we want him so much that we will go on if it takes two years, five years, six years, 10 years, 20 years, and so forth, to find him, to seek him, to ask about him, to knock on the door and be given the opportunity to learn more about God. How much commitment do we make in our lives, aside of church, to put God first? and prayer, our prayer life, to always seek Him. Everything worthwhile takes time. It Amen. takes regularity. <clears throat> Jesus prayed regularly. It takes disciplined times. It takes effort and it takes determination. If Jesus felt, again, the need to pray regularly, how much more must we need to pray regularly? Secondly, Jesus prayed sensibly. Everybody say sensibly. sensibly. See, Jesus, of course, had an intelligent mind. As a child, when he came to earth to show us what it was like to live in the flesh, he was in the Word. He was being raised by parents that brought him up in the Word, the Word of God. He knew about his father. He sought after his father. He actually knew more than his parents, but he was weaned to walk the earth to show us that what he can do, we can do also. Amen. And often at times, we use prayer as a magical device, like a genie. If you rub the bottle and out comes the genie, grant me three wishes, and we're on our way. Thank you, Jesus. The selfish desires. And we must see our need and be more sensible about it. We need to depend on God. I heard this acronym back when I was in youth ministry, D-O-G. Everybody say D-O-G. Now I know it's for dog, but for you, yeah, young people, they like that encouragement to have these acronyms that remind them of simple things. There's also frog, 
frequently, oh, I forgot what that was, but um, dog is dependence on God. It was a way to always remind them. And then there's this song, right? You know, D-O-G, yeah, you know him. And that, you know, we do these little things. Funny as it seems, music sometimes, or acronyms, or even uh, rap music, sounds like that, repetitive things, sensibly reminds us about God. What does it take for you to remember to visit with God every day? I want you to be reminded that we need to depend on Him. All the other things in life will come after. And this community, Ola, uh, Curtis Town, this island, this church, we are called. We are called people, each and every one of us, to be the body of Christ to the world, to Amen. be the light, to be the salt, Amen. to be the bread for the world. We're not called just to gather amongst ourselves, but to love others, to look at the world through the eyes of Jesus. He loved everybody. He went where people said, you know, can go. What are you doing over there? He must be a heathen. No, this is the son of God. He went there and he didn't just conform to their ways. Of course not. He went there so they would know of God's ways. We got to go out. We are called to live and breathe in radical dependence on we need to trust in, or we profess our faith upon, and that is God. God made us, and he knows us, he listens to our prayers, and he answers us. Amen. Yeah? So often, we forget to look at that. We forget to even thank him for answering our prayers, because we're still in the self part of our prayer. We, we haven't seen it. Give us this day our daily bread. Not just me, but all of us. This God gives us the Holy Spirit. See, it says right there in Scripture that He gave us the Holy Spirit to teach us to continue to pray, to believe that we are not alone, that we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. He is within us. We have no room for no other. I forgot who he was talking to, but, um, oh, I think I know. There was a person in the hospital, and they were talking about one foot in and one foot out. They mean one foot serving God and the other one serving the world. You know that the Bible says there's only two, right? Either you serve God or you serve the world. They kept alone every day. It is senseless to see God as nothing more than a pawn, to be used only when times are rough and hard, life is near death, or scrambled up and so screwed up. Nevertheless, he's always there, willing to open up his arms that are already open wide to accept you. It is senseless to expect God to do for us what we may as well do for ourselves. Jesus prayed regularly and he prayed sensibly. And so can we. Thirdly, Jesus prayed confidently. Everybody say confidently. Confidently. Yeah. He wasn't like me. Sometimes I'm like sheepish. I call it sheepish or, or like a mouse, you know, afraid that if I say something wrong with God, you know, I'm going to zap. <laughs> Thy will be done. Not Lonnie's will, not Filet, not Kaluran. Thy will, God's will be done. There's a beautiful story about an elderly man who was gravely sick in the hospital. The minister came by to see the dying man and noticed an empty chair on the opposite side of the bed. The chair was pulled up, especially close to the bed, where he could reach over and touch. 
Many years, um, the older man said, uh, let me tell you about this chair. He said, many years ago, I found it quite difficult to pray. So one day, I shared this problem with my pastor. And he told me not to worry about meeting. Yeah, so often we get into that, oh, you've got to be in a certain posture of prayer. He told me not to worry about meeting. He told me about placing myself in some, he, um, not to worry about placing myself in a pious position. And you've got to be like this, so whatever way it is. He said to put a chair in front of you and imagine God sitting there. And then just start talking to him as if you were talking to your best friend. The older man said, I've been doing that ever since. Well, a few days later, the daughter of the older man called the minister to tell him that her father has died peacefully. And she said, for some reason, his hand was on that empty chair on the other side of the bed. Isn't that strange, she said, to see? Obviously, the father didn't tell his daughter about that story. And, he, and that minister said to her, oh no, it's not strange at all. I understand perfectly well. <coughs> he was reaching out to his best friend, he said. See, when we make God our best friend, we care about him more intimately. And it helps us to build a relationship to get to know him more. Jesus prayed regularly, he prayed sensibly, and he prayed with all the confidence in the world, and so should we. If prayer was so important to Jesus, then it should be for us as well. And I'd like to remind you again what Martin Luther King Jr. said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Mm -hmm. Again. Never forget, take a breath of fresh air. Amen? Amen. Amen.